download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Hello. Yes, my name is James Watkins. How old is your child? Connor is turning 10 on the 16th of April. And would you like to have the party on that date? Yes, his birthday falls on a Saturday this year, so that would be perfect. I was hoping to have a kind of a theme for the party. Last year it was dinosaurs. He's rather obsessed with space travel at the moment, so I was hoping to have the party with that theme. Is it something you would be able to do? Absolutely. We've done quite a few of these types of parties lately. They have been enormously successful. We can even supply costumes if you would like. How many guests are you having? I think about 20 children and some of their parents. What kind of catering would you do? Well, we supply sandwiches, biscuits, sweets and soft drinks. The cost is around $12 per head for the food. If you look on the website, you can see the range of food we can do and decide which things you would like to order. One important thing, though, we need to know a week in advance about any allergies the guests might have. If a child is allergic to dairy or eggs, we can supply separate food for them. But the really serious allergy is nuts. If any one child has this allergy, we have to make sure that absolutely none of the food we prepare contains it. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, that is a really serious issue. What we suggest is that you speak to all of the parents of the children who are invited to make sure none of them have allergies. But with that many children coming, I'm afraid some may need special food. OK, I'll take care of that. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. What about a cake? Can you supply us with one of those as well? Yes, of course. A personalised birthday cake with candles costs £95. As I said before, the theme you want is popular at the moment. So on the website, there are examples of cakes that we have already done. I think there is an astronaut and quite a few aliens. Have a look and see if your son likes any of those. We can always do something original but these should give you some ideas. OK, I'll take a look. Now, for entertainment, we don't want any clowns, as some kids are afraid of them. Perhaps we could have a magician or something. For entertainment, we have quite a long list of performers. We have a couple of magicians on our books, and they are always popular. We also have a model maker who gets the kids to build little cars and planes and things that they can take home. Perhaps they could build a rocket or something. It's all done with paper and they are quite easy to construct, but the final product is very impressive. That sounds perfect. Yes, let's book the model maker. OK, I'll pencil him in. Again, if you look on the website, there is a video of one of his performances at a party. I suggest you take a look before you make a final decision, because the magicians are quite impressive too. Can you book me in for the party anyway? I want to be certain that we are all set for the day. 
Yes, I'll send you an email with all the booking details and the information I require from you a week before the party. The email will ask you for a deposit, which is non-refundable, and that needs to be paid when we confirm your booking. Of course. How much is the deposit? It is two hundred fifty pounds, which is about fifty percent of the cost. With catering, cake, and entertainment plus sales tax, the whole party should come to around five hundred pounds. But I can give you a definite quote tomorrow if you can call me back then. You don't need to pay the deposit until you receive the quote. How does that sound? It sounds expensive, but I don't have time to organize the party, so I suppose I will make the booking. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the director of a musical talking to the cast on the first day of rehearsals. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Welcome everyone to the first day of rehearsals for the musical Summer Life. Congratulations to the cast members by making it through the auditions last month. As you probably remember from then, my name is Robert Page and I am the director of the show. Next to me here is the composer of Summer Life, Anna Maria Church. We are thrilled to be offered the opportunity to mount the first ever production of her latest musical, which she has been workshopping at the National School for Dramatic Arts for the past year. This is James Farley, stage manager for many years in this theatre, who will be handling the technical aspects of the show and is your point of contact for most matters. The romantic leads in the cast are here beside me. Firstly, Tony Andrews, who needs no introduction, as he has been a feature of musical theatre in this country for the last ten years. We also have Abby Shields, who is a recent graduate from drama school and has been heavily involved in the workshopping of the musical. So Abby will make her professional debut here on the stage of the Queen Elizabeth Theatre when we open. We don't have a long rehearsal period for a new show, and things are going to be very tight. But I am confident, with the talented cast that I have in front of me, we will be completely up to the task. We are going to start this morning with a read-through of the complete script, and we have a large table with enough chairs to accommodate you all. You will be told the exact times when we require each of you to be here, and this will vary from week to week. But for the moment, we ask that you clear your calendars for the next six weeks of rehearsal and make yourselves fully available during the days and evenings until we fix the schedule. You all received the script and score through your agents last week, so you should have made yourself familiar with the storyline of the musical. There are also the videos made of the musical numbers when they were workshopped last year, and you would have also received the links to them. It's not easy being in the cast of a first-time musical, so we hope that the videos will have given you a good idea of the musical content of what we are about to produce. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Tomorrow, Anna Maria is going to be with us for the first rehearsals of the main songs, and we need the whole cast here, as everyone will be singing at some stage, and we will be doing some chorus work. As you know, this musical does not have a separate dancing troupe. All the cast will be doing both singing and dancing. We expect the first singing rehearsal to finish at about 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. But let me warn you, this will probably be the earliest you will finish of a day over the course of rehearsals. We expect you to be here at 9 a.m. every morning, Monday to Friday, and we imagine that in the last couple of weeks we may have to call you in at weekends as well. If anyone is sick, we ask that you call in personally to the stage manager. Don't contact your agent and get them to call us, as it means too much delay, and we have to work around your absence. All sick days must be backed up by a doctor's certificate that needs to be sent by email to James on the day of your absence. This is a small cast, and we only have understudies for the four main leads, so we very much hope that all of you remain in perfect health for the complete rehearsal period. Oh yes, this week you will all have your first fittings for costumes. The costume department is downstairs. You will be given the day and time of your fitting later today. Of course, we are keen to get as much pre-publicity as possible for this show, so we are arranging some photo calls and radio interviews for some of the cast members. We ask that you only speak to the press if instructed to by us. If you already have publicity arranged for this time, it needs to be approved by the PR officer here before you can do it. All this is in your contract with us. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear a medical student called Sean talking to his tutor about a subject he is having difficulty studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Thank you, Sean, for coming in to see me. We need to have a talk about how you are coping with your course load. Really? I thought I was doing well coping with it all, considering I have been doing a rotation at Blakely Medical Center for my internal medicine course. How is that been going? Well, of course, I'm not allowed to do much. I mainly just sit in on consultations with patients. I'm happy to do it, Though, as I think, this kind of doctor-to-patient rapport is something I won't see as much of when I study emergency medicine next year. I like it that this course is getting us to do short rotations in hospitals and clinics. It does take away from study time, though. I'm doing well in all my medical subjects, despite spending 15 hours a week at the medical center. That's what I want to talk to you about. You know that studying a number of arts faculty subjects is required before you can graduate. I see you passed a history course in the first year, but you need two full units in an arts subject to graduate in medicine. It's university policy. The course you are doing this year is basic Spanish, and I have heard that you are not doing very well in it. Why did you switch to Spanish rather than just doing another unit in history or a unit of English? I agree it was a mistake. I've never studied a language before, 
and I thought knowing a bit of Spanish might be useful for my future at the hospital. Lots of Hispanic patients come in that can't speak English. That wasn't the main reason I signed on to the course, but people told me that Spanish was a really easy course to get through. I have such a massive study load. If I had to take on an arts unit, I wanted it to be something I could pass without too much effort. Or a unit of English. I understand that, but it looks like you might fail this subject. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Why do we have to do arts subjects anyway? What has it got to do with medicine? As far as I can see, the university hasn't been insisting on it for very long. Studies have shown the medical practitioners who study arts subjects are better able to communicate with those they are treating. So the university has decided to include it in the medical course. There is no way of getting around it. You must have two arts units to graduate. What is your problem with Spanish? Do you not have enough time to study? It's not that. I don't have much time to study for it. But I do make an effort, and I quite like the course. But I'm just terrible at it. I can't understand how my memory is so good for all the medical vocabulary. But I have such trouble recalling any of the Spanish verb endings. It just doesn't make sense. Have you tried having tutoring? Yes, I've had three sessions with a Spanish tutor, but I just can't get my head around it. I think there are some people who have an aptitude for languages and some who don't. I fall into the latter group. I just can't see myself passing the unit. Well, if you feel that way, you are doomed to failure. What I think you should do is discontinue the unit before you fail it. You have to do this before you are halfway through the course. I checked and the halfway point is next Monday. That's why I called you in to see me urgently. So if I drop out this week, I won't have any penalty? Exactly. Then I suggest you take up another history unit next semester. Choose a course that doesn't have an exam and is completely assignment-based. Then it won't interrupt your medical exams. That way, you will probably do the assignment or essay with another student, and there will be less pressure. I think the course that does this is called Europe Between the Wars. You'll probably find quite a few other medical students doing the course. I suggest you pair up with a pure art student, though as they might be more willing to invest time in it. I'll go to the enrollment office about the Spanish course straight away. I'll take your advice on doing the Europe Between the Wars course as well. Good luck. Thank you for coming in. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about silver. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Silver is one of the few metals that were used in prehistoric times, so it is unknown when it was discovered. Because, like copper and gold, it can be found in its elemental form, it was probably one of the first metals used. It was not used in its basic form to make tools, weapons, or cooking utensils because of its soft nature and was utilized in decorative objects and coins for barter. The earliest evidence of the use of silver is in Greece before 4000 BC and then slightly later in what is modern Turkey. Silver was also produced in India, China, and Japan, but its origins are less well documented than in Europe. Silver was rare in its elemental or natural form, though, and it was not until it was discovered that it could be separated from other metals that it became more widely used. Due to its rarity, it was considered more valuable than gold in ancient Egypt. People in ancient times refined silver ore using a process called copulation. This involves heating the ore and blowing air over it. As silver does not oxidize or react chemically when heated, the base metals contained in it that do, such as lead and copper oxide separate from it. Silver coins became the staple of the Greek and Roman economies. The Greeks had their own silver mines at a place called Laurium, where they were extracting about 30 tons a year in 500 BC. An early source of silver for the Romans was Spain, from where they extracted about 200 tons per year, and by the middle of the 2nd century AD, there were about 10,000 tons of silver currency circulating in the Roman economy. The Romans later had access to silver from mines in Central and Northern Europe. This ended with the fall of the Roman Empire, but not before thousands of tons of silver had been extracted. During the Middle Ages, much of the Mediterranean silver had been exhausted, so Central and Northern European mines were opened again but most of them soon ran out of silver. The discovery of the New World offered unprecedented access to silver, more even than the Romans had seen. In the Americas, pre-Inca civilizations started using the cupellation process to divide silver from lead from around 100 AD. The Spanish discovered rich veins of silver ore in South America after 1492. In the 19th century, most of the world's silver production was in North America, particularly Mexico, Canada, and the USA. There was still a small amount of mining in Europe, and Russia had started mining in its eastern provinces. Today, it is China, Peru, and Mexico who are the top producers of silver. But there are mines all over the world that are still functioning and about 20% of silver supply is actually from recycling. The atomic symbol for silver is AG, which is from the Latin word for silver, Argentum. At least 14 languages in the world have the same word for silver and money, and the country Argentina is named after it. The English word silver comes from the Anglo-Saxon word Seolfer, Silver is mainly thought of as being used for jewelry and cutlery, but this is only a small proportion of its use. Pure silver has the whitest color, the highest optical reflectivity, and the highest thermal and electrical conductivity of all the metals. The photographic process makes use of silver nitrate, and nearly 2,000 metric tons of silver is used annually in the traditional photographic process. Though this is declining with the use of digital cameras, it is also used for electrical and electronic processes in wires and solder, electrical contacts and batteries.
Copper is less conductive but tends to be used more in electrical wiring because it is cheaper. It is also used to make light-sensitive photochromic lenses for glasses. Silver's antimicrobial properties have been used to prevent the infection of injuries for hundreds of years. Silver antibiotic creams are used on burn injuries and there are silver-infused bandages for wound care and skin ulcers. Silver nanoparticles are used in clothing to prevent bacteria from creating unpleasant odors. So silver is used in many industries. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.